Let's take two more minutes. students who are supposed to have registered. Um, no big deal, so this workshop has a title that's very precise, but it got changed a little bit in the, the poster. It's called Create Your Own Chat GPT Without Much Code. So we're not going to do much technical stuff for two reasons, because that's not your field, right? You're not engineers. And at the same time, it's also because any technical work is becoming less valuable now. There's no, not much difference anymore in you know, coding and um, engineering. Uh, just for your information, this has been released just a few days or a few weeks ago. There's an AI called Devin, based on ChatGPT, that is um, trained on software engineering, and it has passed technical interviews in big companies like Google, Microsoft, etc. So software engineering is pretty much automated right now. Uh, and I'm, of course, a little scared about it myself because I do a lot of software engineering work. But at the same time, it's also an opportunity to do something new and expand how you can contribute value, not just with technical stuff, but with your ideas that make a difference. So that's what we're going to focus on first. And then we'll see the, the technical aspects in the second part of this workshop. And there's one thing I should mention, it's that very recently OpenAI, the company that makes ChatGPT, released a product called GPTs, with an S, which is pretty much what we're going to do now, but it's already integrated in ChatGPT. It allows people to create their own chatbot, specialize it for some tasks, for example, creative writing or help you do your laundry. And you can share the link for people to use your chatbot, okay? But there's one limitation that's important with this um, product, GPTs. It's that the users who use your chatbot must have a GPT Plus subscription, which costs about $20 per month. Who has a GPT Plus subscription here? You have it for GPT-4, you too? No, no, no. So most people don't have it, right? Especially students. If you're not doing professional work with it, it's really not worth it because GPT 3.5, which is the free version, is good enough for most use cases. So this is one limitation with G these GPTs. What we're going to do will be a custom chatbot that anyone can use, that is free, and that doesn't require you know, any um, subscription. And it also has another advantage, is that when you create your own software, the data remains internal. You own your data, right? Whereas with these GPDs, you have to give your data to OpenAI. Okay? So there are privacy questions, which makes it still valuable to create custom channels. Now, what are we going to build? Is simply a custom version of ChatGPT, as I said. I will explain what ChatGPT is first. So ChatGPT, just like many customer software, it's just an interface, it's like a front, a mask, 
put over a big, expensive piece of research and development behind it called the OpenAI API. So explain what an API is, how ChatGPT is built, and how we can do something similar that is custom. And so for example, what I mean by custom, and that could be a good idea for your, uh, you know, for your final project in my, in my class. So if you don't want to do bubble, this could be a good alternative. Custom could be, for example, a chatbot that only responds in time. That's something that you cannot get easily from ChatGPT. Or a chatbot that would have a certain personality. For example, um, Twitter, now called X, has released a chatbot that is less performant than ChatGPT called Grok. So it's not as good technically as ChatGPT. But the only thing that's special about this chatbot of X is that it has a kind of politically incorrect personality. You know, ChatGPT is very polite. Whenever you say something a little borderline, it tells you I cannot answer. I'm trying to avoid all sensitive topics. This one is a little more, you know, uh, a little more politically incorrect. That's it. That's the only advantage. So we'll see other examples of custom AIs that create value because of their specialization. But this is pretty much what we're going to do. Or you could, for example, create a chatbot that specializes in solving one particular problem. A chatbot for supply chain management, or a chatbot for human resource management, etc. I'll show you more examples later, including examples I've created myself. Now, as I've said, these chatbots, including ChatGPT and Brock and all uh, this wave of generative AI, are based on a big, expensive uh, artificial intelligence that was trained for about hundreds of millions of dollars. So it's now what makes a difference, you know, in quality uh, in AI is no longer the, the engineering, the design of the software, but it's how much you can invest in training. That's why, for example, OpenAI is, um, I mean, some people claim that they are raising seven trillion dollars, seven trillion dollars, not billions, trillions, just to train their next version of AI. So this is where the competition is now. It's in throwing a lot of money at compute to make the AI uh, better. But at its heart, what this AI is, what a large language model is, is something very simple. It's a tool that is trained on, as I've said, large amounts of text from the internet, virtually on the whole internet. So it has learned the whole internet. And it solves a very simple problem. This problem is that you give it a sentence, for example, it was a beautiful day, the sky was, and I don't specify what comes next. And the AI learns to statistically predict the next word. For example, here what makes the most sense in terms of meaning, it was a beautiful day, the sky was blue. Not beautiful because we have already used beautiful, not the limit, not falling, it wouldn't make sense. So it just statistically tells you what is the most likely next word. And then if I take the same input, it was a beautiful day, the sky was blue. I ask it again to guess what next, what word comes next, etc. And so that way you can generate infinite amounts of text. Very simple reasoning, but that requires, as I've said, a lot of compute power. And so the, the most performant uh, AI nowadays is not even GPT-4. There was uh, a better version released by a competitor company called Anthropic, so I, I recommend checking it out when you go back home. It's called Anthropic Cloud 3. This is currently the most uh, you know, impressive large language model. And they have a free version, Cloud 3, so you can test it, you just have to register, etc. Now, the, the big breakthrough in this technology, large language models, came in 2020, so four years ago now, with a version called GPT-3. And that was a big breakthrough because no one expected that this simple problem of guessing the next word, which is similar to, you know, autocomplete that you have in Google, right? So there are many um, other versions that use this kind of reasoning, but no one did it at a large scale, like OpenAI. It was surprising that it worked so well in generating text. Because before, 
before large language models, the way you model text was through semantics. So you need to have a tree of how a sentence is constructed, what is an adjective, what is a verb, etc. GPT does not know anything about that. It just knows statistically what is the next word. And so what we'll do is that we'll access this large AI that was trained for hundreds of millions of dollars, call it, give it a task, and use its response. When you do this with software, this is called an API, an Application Programming Interface, which is simply the idea that one software can call another. So if I have my chatbot here, software one, and there is another piece of software, for example, Google Maps. It's very expensive to create Google Maps. You need to send satellites and you know cars to fill the roads, etc. So my smaller software, instead of having to reinvent everything, to reinvent Google Maps, can simply call it, call this application programming interface, give it some task, ask it, for example, what's the shortest path from here to my home, and then display the response on my own website. This is the same thing we're going to do, but with a different API, the API of OpenAI. Okay? So we're not going to train an AI because we don't have $100 million, right? But we can request input and output from the OpenAI API, and this, of course, has a cost. So they have a pricing for uh, the number of words you get you send as input and you get as output. And this allows you to access their capabilities without having to create you know, everything from scratch. And if you think about it, perhaps um, you can already see it, say, with Grab and other apps. But it's in fact very common for software to work this way. It's very common that you have a big expensive piece of software that other smaller services can call, these smaller services would be more customer-facing, so they would solve immediate problems for people, like Grab. Grab solves an immediate, immediate problem for us, which is um, getting food, and behind Grab, you have a map that, that needs to show you where you are, where the driver are, and that is a general tool created by Google that's also very expensive, that's the API. So a lot of software works this way. It is what we call a wrapper. You wrap some service, like Grab, or uh, say, the SCP app, right? So the banking app is not having to, it is not going to recreate everything within the, the, the process of managing an account, but they use APIs, so they wrap them over something expensive. And this has value. And in fact, the surprising thing with the software industry is that um, these wrappers, so these smaller software that are more customer facing, short term, they are more profitable than the big expensive APIs. So for example, Grab or Uber, in fact, initially was much more profitable than Google Maps. Google Maps costs a lot of money to create. It will make money long term. It's a piece of software that, that, that's here to stay. But short term, in the first few years, the, the apps that directly solve customer problems make more money. Okay? Now some points you may you may pondering right now about AI and what it is going to do to jobs, for example, what kind of um, job you can pursue now that AI is here and that is very performant. And these are not my thoughts, although I have my own thought about this, but what some experts consider as the possible future of work with AI is that it will not replace us. So we're not going to go into you know, a Mad Max type of world where there are no jobs and we have to fight for food, etc. Most likely, AI is going to be just like previous technological revolutions, like the internet itself, like electricity. AI will simply make us more productive. And this is how it tied with my, my class. It's that this is a huge boost for productivity. As an example, this workshop, if we did it two years ago, or before GPT-3, four years ago, would have taken us six months in a master's degree of software engineering. 
But now we can do it in two hours to create a custom chatbot in our business program. So what you could do in years, now you should be able to do it in weeks. Okay, this is the important thing. So for both um, academia, universities, although we are slowly integrating AI, so both for studies and for work, the, the bar, the expectations should be higher for what you are expected to, to generate as a professional. Now that you have access, you know, to the capabilities of AI. And another thing to, to note, I've said it before, but now we'll show more examples, is that in general, in software, limiting and specializing your software is in itself a form of that. Two examples, Uber, and I love this example because it's counterintuitive. This is what Uber looked like initially in its first years. It was just an interface, a wrapper, around Google Maps. So the hard problem was, at that time, to determine the location of two people. We didn't have the tech for it, you needed expensive GPS in your car, etc. Once people got smartphones in their pockets, and Google Maps well, was launched in 2006, around that time, it became easy to locate people anywhere in the map. And so Uber is simply you know, an interface that says, I'm here, you're there, I will wait for you to come pick me up. Okay? So it's really just a small veneer, a small filter put on top of Google Maps. Same thing for Twitter, in fact. Twitter, the capabilities of Twitter, which were initially that you could only send messages that have 140 characters, and then now they have expanded it to 280, so you're allowed to write more, but this remains still limited. Well, this is a limitation over what you can do, for example, with MySpace or older social uh, networks, even Facebook. Facebook, you can write an unlimited amount of text. Twitter is just a limitation of the amount of text you can write. And this has value in itself because it creates a new way to communicate and it makes people, you know, concise in their communication. And so it, it became a culture on its own called microblog. Okay, so limiting things, as counterintuitive as it is in sound, can have value in itself. Value is not just about expanding, allowing people to do more sometimes, but, you know, forcing them to do less can have value. And so, as I've said, short term, this kind of limited, specialized wrappers can have more value than the big, expensive APIs behind them. It's unfair to some extent, so there is no solution to it, but it is what it is. It is uh, what the free market results in. It's that if you spend billions of dollars to create the OpenAI API or Google Maps API, with a lot of complexity, imagine the satellites, the people driving on the road to create an API, uh, you need a lot of time to recover the cost of this expensive piece of iron. But someone who comes and just puts a little interface on top of it and creates Uber, short term won't have much you know, fixed cost invested, so it will be more profitable. This is uh, what it is. For example, Jasper, which is a company that was created right after the OpenAI API was launched. It relies on it, and it is just ChatGPT, but specialized in copywriting. So they don't have their own AI, they just use, they just call the ChatGPT API and receive its uh, output. There is Jasper AI. And so they just specialize ChatGPT in writing about marketing, writing marketing copy. Okay? This company raised $125 million. And they are valued at $1.5 billion. And it is generating more revenue, at least in the first few years, not now. Now ChatGPT has really taken off. But in the first few months, it was also generating more revenue than ChatGPT simply because it solves an immediate customer problem. So all this to say that people like you, business people, can bring value 
in this kind of endeavors. It's not just about, it's, it's really a, a minor thing, you know, the competition about the tech. Now that we all have access to the same tech, pretty much, all, all have access to the same APIs, the competition is in uh, how to use it to solve problems, to solve real problems for people, okay? <laughs> and another thing is that ChatGPT itself is really just a wrapper around this big API that made it more user-friendly. Uh, but you know, when the API was released in the first few months of 2020, around August 2020, no one cared about OpenAI. You didn't hear about it yet in the news uh, because it was not as user-friendly. It wasn't as you know simple. Let's see what the OpenAI API looks like. Later, you will create an account if you don't have it yet in the OpenAI API. But I just want to show you, again, to insist on this point, the, the value of making things user-friendly. You know? Here is what the OpenAI API looks like. In its basic form, it's just a box where you can write anything. And it does what I had mentioned before, is that it guesses the next word, and then the next word, and then the next word, and it continues your, your text. So it's not, it's not as friendly to users as ChatGPT where you have buttons and you know what to do, etc. It's a chat interface, so it's a dialogue. So just making it, making this API more user-friendly in the form of ChatGPT uh, made the product really take off. And another thing, another point, which I think I mentioned in my very first week of operations management, is that as a non-technical uh, person that may work in a tech-related field, there are various ways in which you can create value, things that engineers may not do very well. One of them is through technology intelligence, which is pretty much what we are doing here. It means being aware of the technology market. Technology that does not just mean software, by the way. You may specialize in other technologies that you are interested in. Biotech, for example, or uh, I don't know, space exploration, whatever you are interested in. But it's good in itself to have a deep understanding of some technology-related market. Okay? So you see what technology you resonate with, and try to read as much as possible about it, try to ask yourself questions, etc. There's another way you can add value is through, uh, as I've said, finding use cases and ways to solve real world problems with technology. This is really not obvious, and the people who can do this well uh, are the ones who benefit the most, as I've said, not the ones who create the big expensive technologies, but the people who can use it to solve customer problems. So I've mentioned Jasper, for example, which immediately solved uh, a problem for customers. It was more, more uh, profitable. Countless examples like this of more customer-facing technologies being more profitable shorter. And then, there are also important aspects about managing people in technology. So this relates to project management that we discussed in chapter three, but more on the, the human sides of project management. In, uh, in technology, uh, this is known as product management. So any software product has a team working on it, and there's usually someone to manage it. And that someone, called the product manager, it's not always the case, but sometimes it can be valuable for that someone to be someone of your age, young graduate, who is more in contact with, you know, what customers want. So you can watch many videos on uh, social media about the daily life of a product manager, if you're interested in this career. It is usually about managing people, about trying to make software more user-friendly, as I've said. Right, something that engineers can struggle with. And in itself, it is a valuable career. Okay, so for example, I know a product manager in a company called Goai, which is a Thai tech company that, that sells uh, coupons, etc., for spas and whatnot. And I think I even have a student who is doing an internship there. So this is, uh, a successful Thai tech company 
And the job of a product manager here is not to actually develop the software, but manage the people to do, and orient their work in a way that makes the software friendly to users and able to solve their problems. And so this in itself can also be valuable. And then another thing I want you to realize uh, in your condition, now that you are finishing school soon, is that you also have an advantage compared to the rest of the Thai population, is that you are in uh, an international college. In itself, this has value when it comes to technology and you know, anticipating trends, because first, it means that you are comfortable in English, right? So you have access to information directly from the sources when it comes to technology. And let's be honest, most of it comes from California, so you can get information directly from the sources. And also, you can see ideas that are successful elsewhere and possibly get an advantage in terms of time, get a longer window of opportunity. More time to implement these ideas in the time market. For example, there is no big su successful chatbot, uh, I've tried to research this, uh, for you know, Thai consumers. Most people just use ChatGPT, which is general, but there isn't a software that's specialized in solving you know, Thai people's problem. Uh, and another interesting thing about the Thai uh, tech market, do you know what's the most popular website in Thailand? Obvious. What do you think it is? What's the most popular Thai website, of course, yeah? No, not Google or Facebook, but what's the most popular Thai service on the internet? You don't know really? Sanok? Even bigger. Sanok is for news, right? When you have a problem, where do you go to ask? Yeah. Oh, obviously. <laughs> In fact, it's so, so big, so popular, that you don't even think about it, because it's like part of your everyday life. And Pantip is very old tech. It's tech from like 2009. It's a, uh, a forum, which is, again, two or three generations ago from what, what exists right now. So imagine like uh, an AI trained on Pantip, which is something you can do very easily. That could be potentially huge. What I'm saying here is that you have a huge amount of opportunities in Thailand by being, you know, comfortable in English, having access to information from the sources, you can see ideas that can be implemented here before they, you know, before they, they are successful. And this is in fact a whole, a whole industry of um, venture investments, is in what we call copycats or clones. What's a copycat or clone of a successful website? It's for example, Thai version of, say, uh, Twitter, or Thai version of some startup like DoorDash. Okay? So it's simply copying a business model that works elsewhere and adapting it to your local market. Many big venture capital firms are very happy to invest in this kind of copycats because they know that the business model works elsewhere, so it's just a matter of adapting it. This is if you're interested in creating your own uh, business. And it's something you should do, by the way. So now that you're also approaching the, the date of your graduation, perhaps I should say a few words about this. Entrepreneurship and what's the safest route to entrepreneurship. In general, there are two kinds of careers, two kinds of jobs. What we call scalable jobs a non-scalable job. What's a scalable job? It's that for some work, you do the work once and you sell 1,000 times. For example, if you write a book, you're not going to write each copy that is sold, you write it once, and if you're lucky, and your book becomes Harry Potter, for example, uh, you would scale that work multiplied by thousands, millions of copies sold, okay? That's the same thing for art, for being a, a, video blogger, a video blogger, right? YouTube channel. You just have to record your videos once, and then you get five million viewers, and you multiply your income by uh, you know, each viewer. Same for artistic careers in general, uh, movies, what have you, okay? Same for marketplaces, and this is the key difference between marketplaces 
and small web services, it's that the marketplace can potentially scale. So they are scaled. At the same time, all these carriers that I mentioned are very risky. Because they are scalable, everyone wants to at least get in, try their luck at creating a successful gaming YouTube channel, channel or writing a book or releasing a song. So of course, the risk is higher if the reward is higher. At the same time, you have non-scalable careers. What's a non-scalable career? If you are a dentist, a dentist, on the face of it, has a higher salary than a writer or a YouTuber, right? But the dentist, the problem with the dentist is that they have to, you know, if they perform the dental surgery, they have to do it for each patient, individual. If they make bread, if they are uh, a baker, they have to make each piece of bread manually. So it's not scalable. For each unit of output, you have to put a uh, uh, you know, uh, proportional amount of input. Whereas scalable careers, there's a disproportion. No, no relationship between the output, how many viewers your YouTube channel gets, and you know, the, the amount of work you put on it. It's really um, potentially unlimited. And so the best advice I can give you for your career is to follow a scalable, safe path that's going to be more and more rare. You know, there are going to be less and less jobs that allow you to do this. But at this point in your life, you have an advantage, a big advantage, which is that you are young and you have free time, right? Uh, you don't have most of you families yet, uh, so for five, ten years in the future, you'll have a lot of free time compared to after. And so I recommend following a traditional non-scalable career, dentist, lawyer, uh, marketer, you know, work for Central, work for land and houses, SCB. At the same time, develop some projects, like what we're going to talk about here, uh, in your free time, that could potentially be scalable. Right, that could potentially be multiplied by the amount of success you have. So if you're interested in learning gaming, open a YouTube gaming channel. If you, if you want to do uh, chatbots, create a chatbot that solves some problems, etc. All these are not are scalable. Okay? Scalable products. Alright, so now we're going to talk about the more technical aspects after these business considerations and see how to create our chatbot. So for the technical aspects that I've said, we are not going to do much coding, because not much is necessary, but I think it is interesting for business people like yourselves to understand how software is made, because you may not know it, okay? So what we're going to use, what we use generally to make software, is called an IDE, which is an integrated development environment, integrated development environment, means simply that it's um, a platform where you can write software, but it is on the internet. Okay? The one we're going to use is called Raplet. Okay, Raplet is a platform that allows you to write software, that allows you to copy other people's software, and that can host your software for users to access it. So it does everything. Everything is integrated, just like an integrated supply chain that we studied recently. Okay, everything is integrated in Rapid. So I ask you to please go to Rapid and open an account. It's at rapid.com. <coughs> Click sign up. And you can log in with your Google account, Mahidon or any other Google account. So we'll see what to do at that screen. We got okay. It's working. Alright, so in this screen, uh, when you want to use this is just for their surveys, but for school. Let's say school. How much software creation do you never stop it? Alright, and now we'll stop here. They will ask you about what kind of language you prefer, etc. That's not important. So let me plug in to Replit.
Now, as I've said, it allows you to also copy other people's software. Um, in the software industry, this is in fact the norm. Copying other products over other pieces of code is how pretty much any um, software of a certain scale is built. There is no software that is written completely from scratch. And so, in a platform like this, just like in other platforms like GitHub, you can get access to what we call open source software, which is software you can copy. The, the code is open to anyone, okay? So for example, we can take a look at Replit and try to find something we may be interested in creating. That's not a chatbot. Let's see if they have some video games, for example. They have templates, just like Bubble. But here, unlike Bubble, the big difference is that in Bubble, you don't have access to the source code. You cannot modify it, right? Whereas here, everything is open source. With Replit, you can, so maybe I shouldn't search for video game directly, but some really Flappy Bird, for example. Or you can search for anything you're interested in. And so this is software written by people like yourself that you can copy. And here it shows you the, uh, the language, the programming language that is used. This is Python. This is HTML and JavaScript. Java. So let's take any, anyone. Let's take this one, for example. Once you click it, you see a button here that says fork and run. We'll talk about it in a moment, but for now, here is all the source code. So these are all the files that make this game possible. We'll talk later about what kind of files are required to make a website. But you can read here the source code of the, the game. Each file, you can copy them. And so the important button here is this one. Fork and run. What, is, what does it mean to fork a software? Well, in software development, code has a path, right? It is going through a path where you add things to it, you modify it, etc. as the initial creator of the path. So this is software, for example, that I have written myself, okay? And it's following its path. And then someone may come someday, take the software at some point here, and decide to create a copy of it. That copy is called a fork, just like a fork on the road, when two roads separate, okay? So I may continue my development path, but your own copy is called a fork. Because you will make your own uh, changes to the software. So suppose, for example, that my software that I've created so far had a blue background, and you don't like the color blue, you want to create one, one with a red background, so you create a fork and you just change the background. And so here, the two versions of our software are going to be different. You know, someone else may make a different change, someone else may make a different change, etc. And then at some point, as the main creator of the software, myself, I may decide that I like your change, I like your version. And so I may perform what we call a merge, which is that I bring your own version, your own fork, and integrate it in the main version. So I make it the main, you know, uh, the main version of the, the software, okay? So forking just means copying the software and following your own path in modifying it. So this is what we can do with this game. I don't know if it works well, I haven't tested it, but here I click on fork wrap, like I can give it a different name, my game. I can change its description, change everything. And then it would be copied. So this one is not the main version, it is my fork, my own version. And I can make my own changes to it, it will not impact the main version. Here is the game. And so Replit allows you to run it as well. You know the Flappy Bird game? So if you're supposed to escape the, the obstacles. And this one seems to be played by AI, it seems to be played automatically. And so to show you that you can make some modifications, let's say, for example,
we'll talk later about some basics of you know styling and coding in JavaScript, but I just want to show you a simple change I can make. Let's say instead of generation here, I want to write uh, hello. So this is my own version, my own fork, and it would have a difference or many other differences with the main version. Why isn't it being modified? Let's see. Rapid also allows you to host it, so I can share this URL with someone, and they'll be able to consult my own version. Okay. So this is what a fork is. We are going to do the same thing for the chatbot. You will just fork my own code, copy it, and then modify the chat chatbot to your own needs. Okay. Now our chatbot, I'll show it later, will be something like this. It will be a small software, a tiny software, that calls the big OpenAI API, asks it for you know, uh, answers, and then displays the answers to our own users on our tiny software. Now, a few words about the OpenAI API, because you will also need an account from the OpenAI API. So just go to Google, for example, type OpenAI API. Some of you may have an account at the OpenAI API. If not, go to this website, OpenAI API. Log in. I'm already logged in. And then you go to API. You see what it looks like for new users. You have used it before. Uh, listen, if you have used it before, you may or may not have free credits. Because you get free credits the first time you use it, I think you get $20 of free credits the first time. So check your credits here. Usage. For example, I have $10 of credit. I have used 0 0.28 of it. Okay? You can see your credits here. The API is quite cheap. I think it costs, uh, let me see, OpenAI API cost. Just to give you an idea. For GPT 3.5, I think it's a half a dollar per million word or something like that. GPT 3.5, which is the, the most commonly used. There it is, 0.5 dollars per million words for input, and 1.5 for output. And you can do a lot with the million words. GPT-4 is more expensive, it's $30 per million words. Okay? But you, you get much better results. Right? So, do you have any credit? Expired. Uh, don't be here. We'll find a solution later. Do you have any credit? We should ask you to enter your phone number to verify. Okay? So you're in, excuse me, do you have any credit? No, no, no not pressing, not pressing, just wait to use it. Somewhere. Zero, zero, you don't give credit anymore, you have zero two, or you have used it. No? Yeah, it's expired, so they gave you ten dollars, but it's expired. I can be here, I just want to see how many of you get the credit. You've never used it before? No. So I'll come and say it's fine. 
And you didn't get to go to the bottom. Yeah, if you have another email, uh, another Gmail, you may also use it. Maybe that one has to go. Are you in your platform? I can see. No, I think you got lost. You can take them off. No, 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 If we take a break after this, once everyone is set up, begin. Is there a way to move the train? Yeah, they need to check that you're not getting higher, so let's go ahead. Yeah, they have to check that you're not Okay, move the change to coordinate three. Fifty. Oh, okay. It's not easy nowadays to check that someone is there. No, 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 one. So this one, two, three. Right. I'll come back. You got it? Any credits? Zero. 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 Alright, so maybe we can all use my credits, but I don't know if we can share credits like that. Zero, right? Zero two? No, it's expired. They gave you five dollars, but you didn't use it. So it expired. Zero two? Oh. Expired. Too bad. So you used it before, but you registered, but you didn't use it. So you have five dollars. Not big deal. I'll share my, my API. You got it? Expired. You got zero, so let's do this. No, I never use it. So it doesn't look like I'm doing it. Zero. Expired to you. Have you used it before? Yeah. Now because the API is also what you use in the playground, the one I have, the white box I've shown. So if you have used it at all, they can see that uh, your API is used. So just to show you how it works, to communicate with an API, you need to authenticate yourself. You need to say that you have the right to call it. Of course, because they need to bill you, right? They need to bill your usage, so they need to know that it's really you calling the API. That's why the wait for a software to communicate with an API is through a key. And this key is very sensitive, it's very secret, uh, because if someone has it, they will be able to use the API on your behalf, and you'll be the one paying the bill, right? So each API has a key that allows it to control access, and users show that it's really done by specifying their keys. So if you want to know your key, you go here, API keys. And you can create several keys. For example, I've created one for a workshop here. Same workshop as this one. And you can revoke a key, you can delete it. So I will create a new key, a new API key. Okay, can create a new secret key. Let's call it workshop. 
it has all permissions, but you can control what your key can do. And I will create it. I have a very annoying puzzle, but mine is easier than yours, right? They gave her a super difficult puzzle. And so here is the API key. I, I, I'll keep it like this. I trust you not to abuse it, of course, but the, the cost is limited to $10. So you cannot spend more than $10. Uh, and we'll use it later, after the break, to create our chatbot. Okay, so none of you has any API credits. Right? No big deal. We'll use my own key. Okay? So let's enjoy our 10 minutes break, and then we come back to clear the challenge. All right, so this is my API key, which we are going to use because most of you don't have plates. But it's good that you see how to get your own keys. So do the same thing as me, go to Go to API keys over here. Create new secret key. Give it a name. And then create secret key. This is the key you use every time you write software that calls the OpenAI API. Then you can copy it, but here we are not going to use it because if you use it, it won't work since you don't have credit. So create new secret key, give it a name or leave it empty, and then just note it. Just note how it works. You it? Right. But now you cannot see it anymore, so if you want to get it again, you need to click copy. Just for information, we're not going to use it. All right, so we have all the ingredients. Now let's create our cake. You will go to my own Rapid, to this address, rapid.com, at Andalouche, and the name of the software is MyChatGPT. Make sure to type the address right. I've tried to write a simple chatbot, as simple as it can be, with only one file. This is kind of a difficulty. So the chatbot doesn't look very well, very good, because I didn't spend much time on the styling. Try to keep it simple. But this is really the simplest form of a chatbot that does the job and that can be customized. You got it? Yes. So click on fork and run. So type replicate.com. Now we'll see about this later. But before that, I want to explain the structure of the code. You found it? My chat GPT attack. You got it? You got it? You got it? Okay. So click four and one. Drive your own way. Oh, we're not going to use it. That was just for information, just to show how it works. So now go to my rapid and um, for this one. Okay. The time just here. Don't forget the art. Alright, so what does this code look like? As I said, I tried to keep it as simple as possible, and the simplest form of a web app, let me go to it myself. The simplest form of a web app, be it the Google search engine, the OpenAI chat GPT, or our chatbot here, is that it has three components. 
one file that we call the HTML file, which stands for Hypertext Media Language, I think, Markup Language. So this one specifies the structure of your app. For example, it says that if your app is google.com, the structure of this app is that it should have an image at the center of the screen, an image here. It should have some buttons here. It should have a text box here. That's it. The structure. What elements are in your app? But it doesn't specify what these elements do. What happens, for example, when you click the button. And it doesn't specify the style of these elements. What color, for example, the box is. These aspects are specified in a different file. So there is a file called .css, which starts, stands for Cascading Style Sheet. This one only specifies the style of your app, only the style. For example, the colors of the, the elements of each button, the size of the text box, that's part of the style, okay? The specific location of each element compared to the top of the, the page, etc. Only the style. So, Again, HTML is structure, CSS is style. And the third file, the most important perhaps, is .js, which is JavaScript. This one specifies the logic of your app. What happens, for example, when you interact with it, when you click the button, what should appear, what kind of input output you have, should you send the data to OpenAI when I click the button, etc. All this is specified in JavaScript. But the thing is that you can integrate these three elements in just one HTML file, which is what I have done here. I have only one file. So the whole program, the whole chatbot, is just this file that has 643 lines of code. Okay, 643 lines, index.html. But if you break down this file, you would see that the first component is the HTML, it's the structure. It starts from line one to line... No, actually the first element is the style. You see, it says style here. This is the CSS style. From line one to line 256 is the style. So I've specified the style. Then I specified the HTML from 259 to 301. Okay, and then I specified the JavaScript with the tag script from line 301 to the end of the file. Okay, so everything is included in one file, this file of text. You can copy it as it is. If you don't want to use Replit, just for your information, you can just grab this text these 643 lines, copy them, then put them in a file on your computer. Let me create a new text document, call it example.html. You need to be able to modify the, the extension, so let me quickly do it. So I create a new file, I just grab my text from Replit. I put it in the file.
and it should work just as well. Here it is. Okay? This is just on my computer, not on your head. Okay? So what matters is read the text. The whole app is in the text, this text. 643 lines define everything about your app. You can copy them, just write them on a paper, for example, take them somewhere else, type them on your computer, you get the same results as graphics. Here it is, for example, this one is running on my own computer. You see the address, students, etc. It is a local file. But we are going to use Rapid. So here is my app. I can run it for now just to see how it works. And it will ask me for, it should ask me for my API key, which I will grab from OpenAI. And you can copy my own key, but it's a little, <laughs> it's a little long to, to, to get it right. So how can I share it? Maybe on e-learning. I'll put the key on e-learning temporarily. Just copy and paste the text on the bottom of this. I'll just grab some water and come back. Doesn't know it? 
that still has all the functionalities of OpenAI. You can ask it something. It gives you some suggestions for what to ask. It can read aloud. It can export the charts to a file, etc. Now, what's important in the text at this point, in the code, is how you prompt your chatbot. What is a prompt? It is the kind of personality you give to the chatbot and the instructions you specify for it on how to act. This is a key thing to customize your chatbot. So to go back, for example, to the previous example of this company, Jasper AI, that raised $125 million, their only customization is that they tell the OpenAI API to only respond about marketing copy. Don't talk about anything else. If there's a question about something else, say I cannot answer. Only produce marketing copy. Okay, so that's a way to make the chatbot custom on a very basic level. My prompt, you will find it in line, let me find it, 465 of the code. So this is how I prompted my chatbot to give it a specific task, a specific personality. 465. 65. You got it? 65. 465. You will find the example prompt I've used. Like this. So here I tell my chatbot, for example, you are a chatbot that exclusively responds in Thai. You never, ever, under any circumstances, write in another language than Thai. Only respond in Thai to the following. If it's a greeting, only read back in Thai. You need to insist sometimes. Sorry? Yeah, it's not perfect. We'll see, we'll see. Uh, so these prompts can be long. Sometimes you have to insist. For example, ChatGPT has a prompt that has, I think, uh, 400 lines of instructions. But these are key things to program your chatbot and give it a specific task. Let's see if it works, if it really does only respond in time. So here I input my API key, which I got from e-learning. As it is. And now let's try, hello. Hello, how are you today? How are you? Why does it take this point in time? I'm sorry, I can only communicate in time. <laughs> but you're speaking English. Idiot. I apologize, but I can only respond in time. So my, my prompt is not very, very good. That's, that's what it means. 
Let's try to change the prompt, maybe. You are a chatbot that is using response entire. Not in English. Let's see if it works better this way. because last term it used to work very well in time. Log out. We start again. I will log out with my API key. Type it again. Hello. How are you? It's not working. What language are you writing in? Okay, now, now I remember. But you know, even ChatGPT uh, sometimes has this kind of limitations. AI is completely random. As I've said, it only learns statistical uh, regularities in the text. So sometimes it gives you behavior that's not uh, predictable. So even with ChatGPT, I have a custom set of instructions for it. And very often it doesn't follow them. My instructions for it is usually that it should write simply and short sentences. But very often it doesn't follow. Let's see now if it only speaks in Thai. What's written here? 1988. I think it's because of another game we did last term. I wish you good luck. I'm a group of unknown situations for many of you. Going to put to a culture. Okay, 1988 is because our game, the prompt here. Yeah, if you type 1988, control F 1988. It was a funny game we did last term, 1988, with another prompt. Uh, to give it a role. So one prompt is to specify the rules, the instructions, and this one is to make it play a role. And the role we're making it play is that it is a person from 1988 that only knows events from that period and can tell us about the movies from 1988, like the fashion, etc. So let's try if it can work. For example, what's a good movie to watch. Rayman, true. It's a very good movie from back in the days. What's a hit song you know about? Roll with it. I don't know this one. So that way with the prompts, you can um, like explore the things that ChatGPT has learned and that are not directly available in the general ChatGPT. This can be very powerful. Like when you do things like this, perhaps you can find knowledge from back in the days that is hidden in the, the you know the learning of ChatGPT. So it has recommended this song from 1988. Charlie's Wilson. Does it exist? Let's see. Chinese rules. It's not even on Google. Roll with it. So. 1988. Yeah, it seems to be a different artist. Steve Winwood. And here, remember that I'm using GPT 3.5, which is really not as good as GPT 4, but at least it's doing the job. So, this was to show you the, the prompts. I have two prompts for it here. Instructions about the language to use. 
and the kind of personality to play. So already with these two variables, you know, instructions and personality, you can create some very interesting things. For example, Jasper, which I mentioned, right? So you ask it the kind of format you want, the answer to be in, which is not just language, but it could be, for example, use words that are more technical or use words that are simple. I know someone, for example, who has used ChatGPT API to create a chatbot for children. So you would need to specify rules about what kind of words to use, what kind of topics to cover, etc. This is up to you. Now, I will ask you, uh, perhaps you have done it for your mini project, you're supposed to have done it for your mini project, but to imagine what kind of you know, specialization we could give to our chatbot. What do you think would be fun ideas? Imagine it just for yourself, do it on your own. You have the API key, you have everything. So take these two prompts and try to create something by specifying the, you know, the kind of personality and interactions the chatbot will have. And also some rules for it about the interactions, about the you know, the structure of his response. And here it's always good to, to imagine customer facing problems. So as you think about your own uh, chatbot, I will show you some examples. For example, I know someone at Bayer, which is a, a pharma company from Germany, who is creating a chatbot to train salespeople about dealing with difficult customers. Okay, so you specify to the chatbot, you are a very difficult customer that always negotiates the price down, that is never convinced, always finds problems. And then you send, you know, uh, salespeople to try to convince that customer. So in itself, this is a valuable tool for the company to make their, their um, salespeople tougher. Does it speak in time? Does it speak well in time? 1988 all with it. Oh, only English. Yeah, only took the English words, but the, the English speaking as well is good. So let's see. So for this example of training sales people, we specify here that you only talk about sales, you only act as a difficult customer, and you are here to help our sales people become tougher and more convincing. Okay. Other example, which I've created myself, I've shown you OMBot, but I've done this for other courses as well. I created this uh, website called coursechart.org that has some examples of chatbots. So business communication, if you have taken this class or are taking it with Ajahn Summer, then you can ask it, for example, what is a good email subject. So he is going to go in the lecture notes of Ajahn Summer and find references for this. Hopefully, there it is. It gives you instructions on how to write emails. Operations management, my class, international corporate finance, business law. So this is another example of how you can specialize the chatbot, right? I've also done it for another service called preprint.io. What's a preprint? A preprint is just a research paper in its early stages before it is reviewed by other researchers. It's called a preprint. And it's just research that has been released. So this platform publishes preprints and the chatbot is trained on all papers in the platform. So it can find common you know, knowledge, common ideas in the platform and connect them and answer your questions. So this is a platform that, uh, a chatbot that does research for you, because this is really what research is about. It's about connecting ideas. So this is done automatically by the chatbot. And so what are your ideas? You haven't thought about anything? Now it's your, your turn to imagine something. Take the, the, the prompt and try to think about something. You're supposed to have done it for your mini project, no? What's your idea? Still thinking? Uh, 
Did you do it for the MIDI project? Any idea? You're thinking? Well, what is the most recent update on the project? They said it's going to be really soon, but I'm not sure. No. The only uh, when is the backup is Oh, latest update? 2023. What you see here, we are thinking about years because I've said 1988. So it has limited your KDB. But don't limit yourself, really. Think about problems you have faced yourself, for example, homework, chatbot that makes you, uh, chatbot that is personal trainer, any idea? It's sad, you see, the sack of KDB. You have it yet? Mm -hmm. Not yet. Where is the KDB? It's supposed to be long and clear. Rush. Okay. The future. You see how this is called anchoring. So I've mentioned that it can go in the past, so you think about the future. That that really no limits what you can do. Any yet, Ali? Oh, you should have used the big computer. The model. So for example, in operations management, we have studied project management. So you can have a project manager, AI, and you will specify in your prompt. You are a project manager who is here to lead your teams and get the best out of them. Let's try it. You are a project manager who leads your teams and gets the best out of them, etc. You give advice about how to efficiently manage a project. And so perhaps, besides my own ideas, which are, I mean, around higher education, just to expand your perspective, some people, for example, have created uh, chatbots for uh, one of the most popular ones for dating, actually. It helps people get messages for dating apps. And this one is making millions of dollars in the US. Very simple, you know, customization of ChatGPT. CupidBot, exactly. CupidBot. Some people struggle in the early stages of dating about finding messages to send, you know what to talk about, etc. So the AI does the job for you, and this is making millions. What else have heard about recently? Actually, there's a whole website with examples like this. And you can see the monthly rate of monthly income. System patient admission, radiology, clever bot. What's clever bot?
seems to be a general conversation. They are using it in gaming as well. Like you have characters in the game that can respond, you know, in a creative way. Replica. Replica is big too. Replica creates virtual friends for people who are lonely. It's a little sad. I'm personally against this kind of uses. Ethically, it's uh, really borderline. But this is also a big uh, industry right now. You know, helping people at least feel some connection. But it's quite dystopian. Why is that? A game? Psychological wellness. Right? So therapist could be an idea. In any case, for your final project, you could take your time to think about some idea. Uh, have a nice prompt for it. And here the prompts I've shown are just a few sentences long. Your prompt can be as long as you want. And it's in fact better to have a longer prompt because you can get more, more you know, precise instructions. My, not my replit. Uh, now, one last thing. We are not done yet, we still have 10 minutes. One last thing is that replit, what it gives you is a temporary link to your app. This one. This one will disappear after a while. What we need for the app to become persistent is called hosting. So, for hosting, you can use, for example, Netlify, which is a hosting service I like personally uh, because it's free, does the job very well. All the examples I've shown you are hosted on Netlify, but there are other services like Vercel. Uh, Replit itself has a paid version. So go to Netlify and I will show you how to host your, your website permanently online. Okay, go to netlify.com, please. Log in with Google. Oh, you cannot log in with Google? It's a little more. Log in with email. So if you, if you do your final project with uh, a chatbot, you can just give me the file. You, you won't have time for me to show you all the, the details on Netlify. So just send me the file as your input, okay? Just copy this file and Submit it on e -learn. You can customize the style. Something I didn't mention is that these tags style control, for example, the color of this border. They control the, the size of the buttons. I'll share an example. So here is the, the header, for example, I found this header element. I can make its color red, for example. Okay, so the header has become red because I've modified the part of the code that controls it. And for this, for all technical questions about the code itself, I want to insist on one thing. It's that chat GPT, the, the big chat GPT, is your friend, and you should ask it whenever you have a question about what this part, for example, of the code does, how can I modify such and such part, you just grab your code, copy and paste it, and put it in ChatGPT. Okay? So now there shouldn't be any limitations to what you can create. Technically, there are no limitations because ChatGPT can do it all for you. But creativity is something that hasn't been automated yet, so there is still value and we can make a difference by having good ideas. Ideas that are local, that solve real problems for you and your friends, etc. This is what matters to really. And one last thing before we conclude is that this is the most basic form of customization for a chatbot, but more and more 
um, if you want your chatbot to be competitive, you need to add other things. For example, long-term memory. You want your chatbot to remember past chats, right, and to reference them. GPT, chat GPT doesn't do it very well. There are many people working on this, but this is, so then it can make the chatbot even more powerful. Another thing that's um, popular right now is to reference documents. Real documents, for example, from school, which is what I'm doing with course chat, right? It's not something you can do with the basic chat GPT. You need what we call embeddings and vector stores. So you need to transform uh, documents, for example, course material or the preprints I've shown. You need to transform them into a format that ChatGPT understands and that it can digest. And that way you can fine-tune ChatGPT even further and specialize it, for example, in business communication or operations management, etc. And the last thing that's also uh, very promising are agents. What's an agent? An agent is not like a chatbot where you just have input, output, a conversation. An agent is an AI but can do things for you. So for example, you ask it to create a game for you, and it's going to learn, get information from the internet, do what it takes. And so agents can perform a series of tasks, and they can know what they need to search by themselves. An example of an agent is someone who took an agent based on uh, ChatGPT and asked it to create a business for him. It wasn't very successful, but it was still super uh, scary. So that, let me show you the example. So that agent went and first created an idea. example of an agent is Devin, which I've shown. This one is an agent that is a software engineer. So it's not just something that responds to your queries, to your questions, but it can take initiatives by itself, it can take actions, it knows what it needs to do to get to a goal that you specify. So unlike ChatGPT where you ask a question and it gives you an answer, here you ask, you set an objective, and the agent figures out how to do it. For example, book a flight for me that's very cheap for next week. And it's going to do the work by itself of researching, uh, possibly negotiating, etc. So agents are the next big thing in AI, and you can create them easily with the OpenAI API. It doesn't take much more, but we can only do so much in, in two hours. So I hope this was a good intro introduction for you to custom chatbots. I know it's not easy to get creative ideas under pressure. Give me an idea, you know. So you tend to be restricted, but let it, you know, let it mature in your minds. Very often you get good ideas in dreams when you sleep, etc. So let it mature and I'm sure you can find uh, profitable ideas to uh, customize judging. Alright, thank you everyone. So that's it for our workshop. I'll put the recording on e-learning. And if you want to make this your final project, that's fine. Yeah, I'm coming on. I just have to delete my API key. <laughs> because you can drain my account very easily. So this API key is no longer valid. Yeah, but the point is that your users you have to access. No, no, that's too easy. I want you to use the correct question. You can actually create the folder on either name where you can upload your final project, but because the deadline is soon. So if you choose to do it this way with the chatbot, you still need to submit a little page explaining 
the value of your product, and then just the file. Well, you can ask me in class how to host it somewhere, so you just submit the URL, but both are fine. Right? Assignment. So this is the final product. Final product. Submission. And it is due Wednesday the 27th, right? 27 from, let's say, until midnight. Thank you everyone, see you tomorrow in class.